Pastor Todd here. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Whether you're here in person or online, we are grateful for the opportunity to connect with you. At SCC, we believe that a relationship with Jesus transforms our lives. And so we are passionate about seeing people experience him. If you're joining us online, I wanna encourage you to let us know that you're here by dropping a comment in the box below. Or if you have a prayer request or a spiritual need, we encourage you to reach out and let us know. You can email us at info at sebastian.church. Well, once again, we are so excited that you've joined us today and are partnering with us to reach our community with the love of God. And so take this moment to grab a cup of coffee, your Bibles, and something to write with. Gather your family together and prepare your hearts to worship our great God. Welcome to Sebastian Christian Church. We are so thankful that you have tuned in with us online. And church family, we are excited to say once again, this is the last time we'll be meeting in this way. And we're looking forward to seeing everyone again, again next week. You know, Psalm 108, 1 through 5 reads, My heart, O God, is steadfast. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord. Among the nations, I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. And God's glory is truly over all the earth. And we want you to experience that this morning. And if you already have, it's an opportunity for us to worship our God. So where you are, we encourage you to stand up, sit down, whatever you prefer. Maybe you turn the volume up a little bit, but join with us as we sing to our God praises. Sing Hosanna. Glory to God in the highest. Let's do that together. All right, sing it out. Praise
make us new. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. church because when we see you because when we see you we find strength to face the day in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away so much for joining us today. My name is Camille. And I'm Tiffany. If this is your first time tuning in, we want to thank you for choosing SCC's online gathering. We invite you to click the connect with us button in the chat window. It's also our desire that you would feel valued and loved through this experience. We are so excited as we will all be worshiping together in person again beginning next Sunday, June 7th at 9.30 and at 10.45 a.m. A live online worship experience will continue to be available as well. Please check your email for all specifics, especially the guidelines that SCC has established. All adult midweek uh, activities will resume on campus as well beginning next week. Our desire here at SCC is to love God and love others. If you've decided to partner with us in spreading the gospel globally and locally, we would like you to prayerfully consider giving online by clicking the Give button in the chat window. If you've been encouraged by this online gathering, please click the Invite button in the chat window to share this experience with others. SDC staff and leadership are praying for you during this time of separation. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us with specific prayer requests by emailing us at info at sebastian.church. Please continue checking your email for our weekly updates for information. We are so excited to connect with you today, so please continue to sing with us.
thank God that he is our deliverer. And it's some moments like these where we can worship him and give our hearts to him. He is a God that never fails us, and we need him. Let's continue to worship him.
Father God, we are grateful today that we can sing those words and know that they are true for the believer. That we need you, Father, and you provide, and you're loving, and you are sovereign over all things. And come what may in this life, we can trust in you because you are faithful. And God, there's never been a single time where you've let us down and you've not fulfilled your promises, God. And so we are grateful. We are full of gratitude and love today for you. And the right response for all that you are in our lives is to worship you, is to surrender ourselves before you now. Look to the cross and be thankful for all that you provided. And God, if there's someone listening today or watching today, God, and they haven't experienced, they haven't tasted and seen that you are good. They haven't experienced the life-giving salvation that comes through Jesus. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in them right now. And God, they would sit up, lean in a little closer to you, because God, you're not done speaking to them. And you want to redeem their lives. And so, Father, I pray for every soul that's in that position right now, God, that you would continue to draw them unto yourselves and they would surrender once and for all. They would finally taste and see that you are wonderful and you are mighty and you are awesome in power. And, God, that we lack nothing with you. And so, Father, we are grateful for this time this morning where we can gather wherever we are and as one church praise you and worship you. And so, Father, our hearts are ready. We've removed all distraction, and we want to hear from your word today. So, Father, would you speak to us? Speak to our fertile hearts and let your seed fall fresh and take root and grow. And, God, that we may be not just hearers of your word, but actually doers. So be with us today, God. Thank you for this time. I pray for Pastor Stephen, who's about to come speak to us. God, I lift him up to you and pray that your Holy Spirit would speak mightily and powerfully through him. The message that you've laid on his heart for us. And again, Father, that we would live it faithful to you. And we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. You know, actually, uh, some of you maybe are watching this in the afternoon, so maybe I should say good afternoon. Um, actually, some of you are probably watching in the evening, so I should say good, af- good evening, too. You know what? Whatever case may be, wherever you are, whatever is happening around you, maybe there's kids screaming or you're driving in your car, we just want to say thank you so much for joining with us today. Uh, my name is Pastor Stephen. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here uh, at Sebastian Christian Church, and we're so blessed that you could be joining with us uh, today as as we talk about some really important things, I think. Um, and for those of you guys um, that are just joining us today, uh, we're talking about margin, a uh, sermon series about margin, creating margin in our lives. And last week, we talked about uh, financial margin, you know, what it means to create a financial margin in our lives. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but for me, like, f- creating financial margin was one of the things in my life that actually helped me to be more at peace, more uh, at peace with not only with my family, but with relationship with God as well. So, so, so I thank you, Pastor Todd, for that message uh, last week. Well, today, I get the privilege of uh, talking to you guys about a different kind of margin, uh, and it's one that maybe you haven't thought of. Um, it, it's called a moral margin. Uh, some of you may be scratching your heads, and you're like, okay, where is he going with this? Um, well, let me kind of like, explain this. Um, before I get too deep into this, um, I, I, you've probably heard me say this before. When I preach, I, I, I often do say this as a disclaimer. Whenever I preach, it, it, I can become really long-winded, right? And for me, I can just keep talking and talking and talking, and uh, I, I probably don't even have enough time to talk about this in its entirety. So what I'm going to try to do is talk about one specific area of moral margin, one specific area in where we can create moral margin uh, today. And and for parents, just so you know, and for those of you that are joining us in the room today, this message is going to be a little bit PG-13. So if you've got little ears, feel free to jump in into our children's programming. We've got some great stuff going on over there uh, for for them. So um, before I get too deep into this, I want to start off with a question. I think that in order for us to kind of frame our our minds for the conversation today, uh, I should start off with a conversation with a question. So let's do this. Um, Let me ask you guys a question. Do do you know what the difference is between wisdom and knowledge? 
Do you know what the difference is between wisdom and knowledge? No? Some of you are shaking, shaking your heads. You're like, no. Okay, well, there, there's, two, there's two strains of thought, right? The first group of you, you're probably like, I have no idea. What, wisdom and knowledge is different? Okay. Um, the other half of you are like, yeah, wisdom and knowledge are different. They're two separate words. Obviously, they mean two different things, right? In order to answer that question, right, and to kind of set the, 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 the guides for today, um, we need to see what Scripture has to say. So before we get too far into this, we're going to um, open up our Bibles. If you've got Bibles, um, open them up. If you, uh, if you have a Bible, grab one. Uh, if you don't, uh, some of you are watching online today. Um, you can boot up your, your phones, your tablets, or your computers, and they most likely have one. There's also the thing called the Internet, um, and that has, there's a Bible on there as well. Um, but for those of you joining us on our platform today, we also have a Bible provided for you. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, open up to James chapter 1. I feel like that's a good spot for us to start off with today. So uh, open to or turn on your Bibles, and let's read together. Ready? James chapter 1, starting in verse 1. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, You must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom fails or falls, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, having stood the test. That person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of fruits fruits of all he created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've done in our lives, uh, all that you're continuing to do. Father, we ask that this time be used for your kingdom and glory. Help open our eyes and our ears so that we may listen and we may hear. Father, help us to, as verse 5 says, um, just continue to uh, pour in and let the wisdom of Scripture just pour over us. We ask that you uh, speak to us today, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, now we've kind of had a little bit of a a foundation. Um, I should probably mention this to you. You may have heard this before. You may not have heard this before. Someone come up to you, and they go up to you, and they say, the conversation about morals is over. Have you ever heard that before? No? You've never heard that before? No? Anyone? No? Never heard that before? Really? You've never heard that before? Okay. So, you probably don't hear those exact words, right? You probably hear statements like, this is what everyone's doing, right? Right? This is what everyone does when they go to high school. This is what everyone does when they go to college. This is what everyone does when they have their first job. This is what everyone does while they're dating. 
This is what everyone does when they get engaged. Everybody's doing this thing, so, you know, you should do it too. Maybe you've heard that. The saying, like, everybody's doing it, and you should do it too. You know, I think this is one of the, the challenges that students face, especially those that are uh, graduating. And for those of you that are, have just graduated high school, we couldn't be more uh, proud of you. We are so proud for our, our graduates. But it's not just students, right? Not just students, not just the things that they face when they're going to college or that they're trying to, like, kind of get into the world, right? It's, it's for all of us. We kind of have this idea of, like, keeping up with the Jones mentality. You know what I mean? Like, they got a new car. We should get a new car. Ours is a 2019. Ours is a 2020. And it's like, oh, I should get a new car. You know, this idea of everybody's doing it, and you should do it too. We live in a culture that prizes and promotes, above all else, sexuality and moral relativism. And we hear statements in our culture today that there's really no right or wrong. And even if there is a right or wrong, there's no way of knowing. You know, what's good for you is good for you. What's good for me is good for me. It's fine for me to do this. It's fine for me to do this. Don't judge. Now, some of you in, in the room and some of you online, you maybe feel the need to make an excuse. And you're like, you know, when I was younger, we never had to deal with X, Y, and Z. When I was your age, we never had to deal with technology. Or maybe you're younger and you're, in the state and you're kind of in the stance of, you know, like, if only I grew up in the 1800s. Man, that would be just awesome. I wouldn't have to deal with any hard times, you know. Or maybe it's the 1900s or the, the 1940s or the 1980s. Shout out to those of you guys, by the way, born in the 1980s. Yeah, we're like, whoop, whoop, that's right. But hey, listen, it's not an accident that we are born in this cultural time and not another. It's not an accident that we are born here and now. God chose for us... Not just for us, even. God chose for us and our kids to be in this time and this place. And, and, and if I'm honest with you, I struggle with that sometimes as a parent. And, and maybe you do too. That our kids, they have to deal with, and they will have to deal with vices and issues that we have never had to deal with growing up. If only I was in a different time. If only I was in a different place. Or, or maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe you're in the definite demographic where you say, like, man, I wish I lived in the olden days, the good old days, right? I I've been doing some research on the good old days. I don't know when they were, but it sounds great, to be honest with you. I've read a lot about them, and it sounds awesome. Maybe to give us a little bit of comfort in this, uh, the Apostle Paul on Mars Hill, when he's speaking to Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, he has to say this, he determined, meaning God determined, the time set for them in the exact places for which they should live. That God chose for us to live in this cultural moment, right? So let me say this as definitively as I possibly can and as clearly as I possibly can so that you understand. There is no way around the issues. There's only through the issues that we're going to talk about today. There's no way around them. We can't side skirt them. We can't just shovel them under the rug. The, you know, in culture today, we, we tend to do that. When we have hard topics and hard things that we don't want to talk about, we tend to just shove it under the rug. There's, there's no way around it. There's only through it. And in order to give us light and wisdom onto where the Lord wants us to land today, we need scripture to help us out. And I, and I really do believe that. As a pastor, as a person that's in the church, the body of Christ, we do need scripture to help us and to point us and to direct us how we should live. And if you're following and you're paying attention or you're following along with us at home, uh, verse 5 kind of gives us that, that, that setup for that. I mean, sexuality is everywhere in our culture today. So how do we deal with it, right? How do we as the church, as the body of Christ, his people deal with all the issues that are at hand today? I mean, should it even be an issue? Why should the church even be talking about this? Why should the church be talking about morals? Why should the church be talking about sexuality? Why should the church be talking about hard topics at all? It's because it's important. It's because it's what Scripture tells us to do. And I think in order to start off this specific part of the conversation, kind of to give you another question, because I know you guys like questions. I mean, show of hands, how many of you guys like questions, yeah? No? Okay, some of you do? Good, okay, good. Let me ask you another question, and this may make some of you uncomfortable. How many of you know someone whose life has been wrecked by sexual sin? Do you know someone whose life has been wrecked by being morally compromised? And maybe you're in the room and you're just thinking, I have no idea what that means. Well, <laughs> that's what I'm here for. I'm here to help you out. So let me, let me kind of give you some examples just to get you thinking. 
You know, maybe you know someone who struggled with pornography and it's taking over their lives. And it's wrecked how they view other people. It's wrecked how they have conversations, how they have relationships with other people. And for them, even being around people is hard. Or maybe you know someone that's been in and out of trouble because of the poor choices that they make in their life. Because they have no boundaries. Maybe you know someone who slept around a bit before they were married. And now they carry baggage from all those past relationships. Maybe you know someone who's had an affair. And now their marriage is in jeopardy because of their sexual sin. I want you to think about that. Just for a moment. And I want to like frame this in the way that kind of gets you thinking. Because, you know, when I ask this question to, to students, you know, about boundaries being crossed and, you know, morals being thrown out, I'm usually met with, um, if I'm honest, a blank stare, kind of like this. And they're like, oh. And, you know, and it's, it's fine, right? Because that's our, that's, our, that's our inclination, right? And some of them, if they're honest, or if they're maybe a little bit more, you know, forefront about their information. They say, yeah, I know someone like that, but we just don't talk about it. Like, we don't talk about it with our friends. We don't talk about it together with one another. We just know about it. And, you know, it's like kind of here, but we don't really do anything with it. Some of you in this room and some of you watching online, probably half of you have probably just tuned out right now because it's kind of a chord that hits a little bit too ho- close to home. It's something that you maybe know or maybe something that you're dealing with or maybe someone that is close to you that is dealing with and you're just like, "Mm, this is a topic that I really don't want to talk about. I don't want to think about it because if I have to think about it, then I have to do something about it. And and for some of you online and some of you uh, here in the room, you know maybe this is something that you have to struggle with. This is something that you are struggling with because it's uncomfortable for you. It's uncomfortable to have to talk about these kinds of things. Like in a personal setting, let alone in a group setting. And it's interesting, if we're honest, you know, because I like being honest with you guys. And, and to be fair, I like being honest with you guys. Um, it's interesting to me, you know, when we have this conversation um, about morals that, you know, I don't know anyone that has ever come up to me and they've been like, yeah, I'm in this situation. And uh, you know what? My five-year goal has been that, like, you know, I really wanted to, just to push everyone away. You know, I really just wanted to do that. I really wanted to, uh, to, to be the kind of person that, you know, is addicted to, to pornography. I, I really wanted to, to, to be that kind of a person. You know, my friends, they all started out like, yeah, I just really can't wait, you know, for, for my family and my life to become so dissolved, become so hurt, so morally compromised. I've never heard anyone say, oh, yeah, you know what? If only I play my cards right, maybe I can lose my marriage. Maybe I can lose the respect of my kids. Maybe at the end of the day, I can just, you know, have my life totally be in shambles. In the same conversations that I have with these people, I've never once heard them say, you know, if I only play my cards right, this can happen to me. No one started out with this mentality that, oh, man, if this, if this is something I just work towards, it can happen, you know? I can get it done, you know? I can, I can become addicted. I can become compromised. I don't know anyone who thinks like that. And yet it happens all the time, doesn't it? It Kind of like as a battle cry for the lost, we hear it repeated over and over again, right? The statement like, I've never thought it would happen to me. I never thought that I would end up like this. I never thought that it would happen to me. In my conversations with students, in my conversations with with people around me, you know, that they have this this, this, this saying, like, I never thought that it was going to wind up like this. And what these people lacked and what they have in common, right, is the same thing. Is at some point in their life, they lack what we're going to call moral margin. And you may be asking, what is a moral margin? If you're taking notes, I'm going to tell you it's exactly what I mean. Our working definition for moral margin is this, putting distance between yourself and temptation. Putting distance, a buffer between yourself and the thing that is causing you to become tempted. And for some of you, that makes complete sense. And you already know where I'm going with this. Because it's something that you know, right? It's something that you know. But you are the same people that have not committed to doing this. You are the same people that know this to be true, but have not committed to doing this. 
And here's what I've been praying for over these past few weeks. As I've been praying, preparing this message to, you know, through God's word and just kind of going through this, that whether you're a Christian or not, that by the grace of God and his spirit, that he takes a syringe of life and he sticks it in your soul so that your soul is so invigorated or, or reinvigorated that your meaning of morals and sexuality goes to a completely different place for you. And this may be super hard for some of you because you're right in the middle of this today. And I've been praying that God, through his grace, gives you exactly what you hear today, what you need to hear today. Tangents aside, let's keep going. All right, so let's look at James chapter uh, 1, 13 through 15. He has some really great verses uh, dealing with temptation. Here's what James says. No one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God since God is not tempted by evil. And he himself doesn't tempt anyone, but each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. To death. Let's say verse 14 one more time, shall we? But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. The Bible says that we are dragged away, that we are enticed. If you're taking notes, here's what it means. It means to entrap, allure, to entice. It literally means to hook. How many of you guys are fishermen? You guys like fishing? Any? Yes? Okay, some of you guys are fishermen. Okay, that's good. Uh, I could tell you, I couldn't tell you what side of the pole is up and what side of the pole is down. I mean, if we're honest, uh, I, I just don't fish. It doesn't happen to me. I can't do it. I, I've tried fishing. I've tried catching fish. It doesn't work. I don't know how you do it. Maybe some of you are luckier than I am. It means to hook, right? To, to catch with bait. Our spiritual enemy, Satan, is trying to hook us into something that would cause sin to be born. Because when it's fully grown, it doesn't lead to life. It leads to death. Say that with me again, please. Sin leads to death. Say it, ready? Sin leads to death. Enticed, lured, baited, hooked. The sense of, I never thought that it was going to happen to me. I never thought that it was going to end up like this. But then, zing, hooked. And there you are. You know, before coming here, I worked for a number of years uh, as a mentor for students. And now as a youth pastor, you know, students often want to know, you know, if I'm dating somebody, how far can I go? Like, how far is too far? You know, like, where's the line? Now, let me explain. Uh, those of you guys that aren't parents, you're probably thinking to yourself, that's great. It's good for us to kind of instill on our students, you know, and our kids where the line is. It's good to know where the line ends, right? But see, those of you guys that are parents, you probably understand exactly what, I'm, what is happening right now. See, they're not asking, like, where's the line, like, so that they can, like, you know, oh, stay far, far away from that. They're asking, where's the line so they can get, like, right smack dab up against it, right? They're asking, where's that line? Kind of like I have a, I have a two-year-old, and she loves to put her face against the glass, and that's what they want to know, too. They want to know how full close can they get to put their face right up against that glass, that they're smooshing up against that line. They're not asking, how close can I get because I would want to stay far away from it. They're asking, how close can they get because they want to get right up to it. Which is really interesting to me because, you know, um, I, I don't know about how many areas in my life that I can say, you know, how, how close can I get without this actually hurting me? Um, some of you guys have been doing a lot of things to, to keep occupied uh, during this whole coronavirus thing. Um, for me, I, I, I've actually built a couple things with a saw. And uh, I've never once said to myself, you know, there's a safety on that saw. And if I just take that safety off, I wonder how close I can get these suckers to that blade. I wonder how close I can get without it actually hurting me. I've never said that. People don't do that. That's ridiculous. And yet, for some reason, when it comes to temptation, people are like, how close can I get to the edge without getting seriously hurt? It's not a big deal. It's just Instagram photos are harmless. It's no big deal. It's just a TikTok. I just watch it. Everyone else is watching. It's not a big deal. It's no big deal. I go online, I scroll through Reddit, and I see things all the time. It's no big deal. It's maybe something pops up once or twice, and that, you know, I'm like, whoa, okay. And then it kind of leads to more. It's no big deal. Everybody else is doing it, and I should do it too. How close can I get without somebody getting hurt? How close can I get without myself getting hurt? 1 Corinthians chapter 6 um, 
has something for us to say. And I, wanna, I want us to all look at this together. So I'm going to give you a moment to, to pull it up, to open it. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20 um, has, has a lot to say. But I want to focus one on this part, on verse 18, really quickly. The first word of this verse is really important. And we're going to all say this together. I think because it's important that we do this together. So on the count of three, we're going to say the first word together, okay? This is good for you. It's good for at home for your timing. Ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Flee. The first word says flee. Notice how it doesn't say flirt. It doesn't say get close to sexual immorality. It doesn't say, mm, you know, kind of, you know, mingle yourself in there just a little bit, you know. It says flee. 618 says flee sexual immorality. Do you guys know what the word flee means? I mean, do you know what the word flee means? Because uh, when I'm talking to students, you know, I ask them a question. It happens a lot. Maybe you have uh, children of your own, and this kind of happens to you, right? Where, where you, you have to repeat yourself a lot. And maybe you have to repeat yourself once or twice or three times in order for something to sink in. I think that it's important for us as people. In order for us to have things sink in, we have to have it repeated to us. And so I'm going to say it again, flee from sexual immorality. But do you guys know what the word flee means? I often ask students, hey, do you know what this word means? You know, because we have an idea as adults, you know, that everyone understands when we're talking, but that's not necessarily the case. People don't always understand the words that we use sometimes. Do you understand what the word flee means? Well, let me tell you. It means to escape. It means to distance oneself. Flee. Flee from it. Get out of town. Pretend like your pants are on fire and you're just like screaming and booking for it, right? You know, a mentor of mine once said, uh, to, to flee means to do a complete 180 from where you're at and bolt away from that thing. It doesn't say 90 degrees. It doesn't say 72 degrees. It doesn't say 70, 179 degrees. No, 180 degrees from where you're at to where you need to be. Flee. Flee from sexual immorality. Run. Don't ask yourself, how close can I get? You know, remember earlier when I asked you the question, the difference between wisdom and knowledge? Do you guys remember that? I know that was like an ages ago. That was ages ago, wasn't it? See, knowledge says, I know it's wrong, and I probably shouldn't be doing it. But wisdom says, it is wrong, and I shouldn't be anywhere near it in the first place. See, knowledge is saying in your head, I know it's wrong, I know it's wrong, I know it's wrong, but. But wisdom is saying, it is wrong. I shouldn't be anywhere near that in the first place. Wisdom is saying, I know where my margin is. See, the wise person is going to put significant, uh, put a significant distance between themselves and sexual temptation. And you're probably looking at me and you're like, Stephen, seriously, you just keep talking about sexual temptation. Why are you focusing so much on that when there's so many other things that we could be tempted about? There's so many areas where our morals can be compromised. The reason is because I believe that it is the, one of the most dangerous and devastating things, not just to our culture, not just to the body of Christ, but to the church as well. That this is wrecking relationships. It is wrecking families. It is wrecking marriages. It is wrecking relationship with God. Scripture goes on to say this in verse 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple for the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? Here's what the Bible says, right? It says you are not your own, that you are bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Now, some of you are probably saying, it's my body. I can do whatever I want with it, right? Well, if you're a believer in Christ, I want you to think about this, that you are a dwelling place for the Spirit of God, and Scripture says you should honor God with your body. You might say back, well, isn't it the goal just to have fun? That's what we're supposed to do while we're on earth, right? YOLO, live life now. We're supposed to have fun now. This is the time where I'm supposed to be. This is the time where I'm supposed to be. When you're dating, this is what you're supposed to do. When you're in school for the first time, this is what everybody does when they go to college. Isn't the goal just to have fun to do it? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? That's not wrong, is it? Everybody else is doing it. What's the big deal? Why do I need margin in my life? Here's what Paul says in Ephesians 
chapter three, 5, verse 3, Paul says this, But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. Not even a hint. Um, I do a lot of cooking at home, and uh, let me tell you, uh, when it calls for like a hint of salt, right, I'm not just going to like take a cup measure and just pour salt into it. That's ridiculous. I'm not going to take a handful and just throw it on in there, right? Because that's ridiculous. When it calls and it says not even a hint, that means like the smallest, the tiniest, the most insignificant portion, not even that little bit should be in there. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. You see, in the world that we live in, and by the world standards, the bar for morals is set super low. I mean, like, super low. Like, if you're looking at me, the bar for morals is like this, okay? The bar for morals is set low. And so often we think to ourselves, I'm better than most people. Have you seen that guy over there? His life is a mess, and I'm way better than him, right? Because that's what we do. We live our life by comparison. God says, not even a hint of sexual immorality. Not even a hint. His standards, God's standards, are so incredibly high. And yet we paint that bar to be so incredibly low. You know, what are we going to do, right? What are we going to do? The bar is set so low. So, so maybe we should think about changing where the bar stands, right? Maybe we should think about where, where we should set our standards. You know, um, a, 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 a carpenter friend of mine once told me that, you know, your cuts are only going to be as good as your measurements, right? Uh, for those of you, how many of you guys have ever used a ruler before? If you use a ruler to figure out how much water you should drink, that's probably going to be wrong, right? You're, you're probably going to be wrong in your measurements, right? We use a ruler to figure, figure, figure out length. I could, you know, listen, I can debate with you if you want. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure we use a ruler to determine length, okay? Um, so you guys can just stop judging me. Um, I don't know and how to do stuff that often with my hands. So I, I, I kind of pull things from the air sometimes. So it's, it's, it's fine. Um, so we use a, a ruler to measure length, right? Not a m ruler to measure volume. So we have to kind of figure out what the right ruler is, right? What the right rubric for living is. And for some of you who are living by the, the world standards, where that bar is set incredibly low, you may be fine because you're comparing yourself too low. But we're looking to compare ourselves to God's standards. And so I want to kind of give us an idea of where we should kind of land today. I, I'm a real big believer in application um, in God's word, and I think that, that, that Jesus was too. He gave a lot of clear examples on how we should live. And so here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue that we should probably aim to live a not normal life because if normal is setting the bar down here, normal's wrong, right? And so I'm looking at you and... and uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of expecting that you guys are looking at me a little bit crazy right now. You're like, Stephen, you want me to live not normal? Yeah, I, I'd like you for, to just kind of bear with me for one moment. We're doing a financial peace course um, at our church, and Dave Ramsey says this, if you want the same results, do the same things. But if you want different results, it, it's time to do something different. In other words, don't settle for normal. Because why would we ever want to be normal? I mean, think about it. Think about what's normal. Think about what the bar is on normal, what everyone else says is normal, right? You know what's normal when it comes to compromised morals? Normal is pain and regret. Normal is guilt, insecurity, and fear, lust, and divorce. That's normal. Why is that normal? Because our, law, our line of what is right and wrong when it comes to sexual sin and temptation is in the wrong spot. We are called as followers of Christ to put distance between ourselves and temptation, to draw that line in a different spot. Philippians 4.8 says this, and this may be hard and challenging for you, some of you, um, so let me kind of walk you through it. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. How can we put space between us and temptation? How can we do that? How can we draw the line in a better spot? We've got to frame, reframe our minds, honestly. If we're, if we're talking about where we should be drawing our, our life and where we should be drawing that line, we've got to draw it in a different spot. We've got to be changing the way we do things. So I'm going to give us a couple spot instances in where we can change that line. 
Admittedly, though, these may not seem very normal. Um, but hey, we don't want normal results, do we? I've got some suggestions that some of you may write off as weird. Um, and others, you may say this is pretty wise. The first thing is this, um, I want you to, 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 to figure out where you stand, right, where you are right now, and, and see maybe if you, you fall into this category or not. The first thing, if you're taking notes, is I want to encourage you guys to dress for spiritual success. Dress for spiritual success, right? When you dress, dress in a way that brings glory and honor to God. How you hold yourself, what you wear, bring glory and honor to God. The second thing, and if you're dating, is this, um, keep four on the floor. It means four feet on the floor, okay? And keep to to public spaces, whether you're watching a movie or, you know, you're out in public. And just in case you're wondering, uh, the bedroom is not a public space. Um, I just thought I would clear that up for some teenagers that may be watching out there. The bedroom is not a public spot, okay? Good. Now that we've gone through that, um, next, if you're taking notes, no sleepovers or playing house. You know, very normal, right? It gets late, you're dating somebody. Oh, you can use my toothbrush. You can wear my shirt. Don't go, stay here. It's fine, it's fine. No. Another thing that I would suggest is this. Avoid going to dangerous places. Whatever those might be for you, and you're the one that knows best what that dangerous place might be for you is, right? For some of you, it may be going to bars or clubs, right, with people after work. Or others, it could be online in chat rooms or the websites that you visit, right? Maybe for some of you, it's going to the gym. You know, visually, you just can't handle it. Avoid going to dangerous places. If it's dangerous for you, avoid that. You might say, that's not normal. Of course it's not normal. We want not normal results, right? So we should try not normal things. Whatever is dangerous for you, I'd recommend that you avoid that at all costs. Avoid that at all costs. That you'd flee at all costs. Another thing is, I, I would, and, I, and I'm a firm believer in this, is that you monitor your impact, internet activity. And I want to just talk about this for a moment. This may seem like a little bit of a tangent. But, you know, in today's world, whether you're on your phone or your computer, you've got more access, More access than any person ever has since the history of mankind. At your fingertips. It's all right there, just one click away. Here's what I want to recommend to you. Set up accountability. Well, accountability, what does that mean? Have someone get logs of your viewing habits. Set your computer in a public spot where people can see what's going on. Whether it's your parents or your spouse or it's a good friend, right? And let me just say this. People, people often, they look at themselves, right? They look at accountability as something that's for weak people. Let me be really clear about this. Accountability is not for weak people. Accountability is for wise people. Accountability isn't for people who are weak. Accountability is for people who are wise. And we want to be wise, don't we? Monitor your internet activity. The next is this. And final. Avoid time alone with the wrong people. Avoid even intimate conversations or inappropriate conversations with people that you're with. Husbands, that, you know, that could be you know, talking about your wife with other people. Guys or girls, avoid those inappropriate conversations. Avoid intimate conversations with people that you shouldn't be having those conversations with even in the first place, right? Avoid time alone with those wrong people the people that are going to pull you away, the people that are just going to continue in bashing the people around you. You know what it is. You don't need me to tell you, but we all have people in our life that just like to be negative, that like to pull other people down. Avoid those people if you need to because they're just going to bring you down. Last is this. uh, Guard your eyes, mind, and heart in everything that you do. Guard your eyes. What does that mean? Be careful in what you see. My kids have this, you know, this little song. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Right? How many of you guys, parents in the room, you know that song? Okay. Uh, For the Father up above. Okay. So be careful in what you see. We know this, but we don't practice it, do we? In the TV shows that we watch, in, in the movies that we go to, everything that comes into our mind changes how we live, whether we realize it or not. Be careful what you see. Be careful what your mind, what you fantasize about. You know, the memories that you have. Take those... Thoughts and hold them captive. What does it mean to hold captive your thoughts? 
Well, let me give you an example. Job um, says this, right? I have made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully, lustfully upon a woman. Do what Job did. Make that commitment. Guard your eyes. Guard your mind. Guard your heart. You're probably saying, Stephen, this is definitely not normal. This is super weird. Why are you having me do all these things? It's just crazy, right? Flee sexual immorality. Don't flirt. Flee. And if we're honest with that, and if we're serious with that, and if we're not just using our knowledge, but we're using wisdom, and we're saying, how can we do that? We have to have not normal things set up in place. I've never known a person, right, who, who I look up to, who I respect, who is my mentor, right? I never looked at those people in my life and said, it all, created when I, it all started in my life when I created moral margin, right? This walk to sin all started with when I created margin in my life. I've never heard someone say that. Brother, I know a lot of people who have said, I never thought it would happen to me. I never thought it would end up this way. Uh, let me just be clear in, in something, uh, because I don't want you to think that I'm living a life of double standards. I have margin in my life. And, and, and frankly, I don't want to live without them. I want my kids to know that they have a father who is a man of God, who is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. And if you're here today, and you're looking at me, and you're like, Stephen's perfect. <laughs> I just have to laugh because I can't imagine any of you are saying that. But just in case you are, I'm not perfect. But I want them to know that I'm a man of God who is seeking after God's own heart, who is trying to live a pure and honest life by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want my daughters to know that they have a father who does not objectify women and always strives to treat their mother with honor and respect. I want them to seek after God's own heart. And in fact, I want them, when the time comes to look for a husband, I want them to look for a man just like that. Not like me, but like God, like Christ, right? I want my wife to never worry a day in her life about my integrity and devotion to her. I want her to feel secure. I want her to feel blessed and treasured and protected. I want my God, the one who sent his son Jesus and pulled me out of sin, who transformed me from my life of selfishness. I want him to be honored with my body, with my heart, with my soul. This may be hard for some of you, but let me ask you the last and final question. Let me ask, how many of you would say, and if you're honest, that you probably don't have the moral margin in your life that you should? You don't have the moral margin in your life that you should. Some of you may be going, oh man, there is just a more than a hint of this in my life. There is way too much of this, and I feel serious conviction right now. Others, you may be saying, how could God ever love someone like me? I've messed up. I've screwed up so bad. Here's what I want you to understand. That God loves you so much. God loves you so incredibly much and that you are the one that he came for. You are the one that he sent his son to die for. You are the reason that he sent Jesus. You may say, I'm so lost and it's so dark and my life is so messed up. You are exactly the one he came for. And there are those of you who are here today and you're rude. You're fully aware of your sin. You're aware that that sin is separating you from God. You're aware that, not, that everything in your life isn't how it should be, isn't how God wants it to be. That's great. That is the first step. It is important to realize that we're not perfect. It's important to realize that we are sinful, that we are fallen. Because it's that that calls for a need of a Savior. And there are some of you that are going right now, I really do need help. I really need help. I need healing. I need forgiveness. I need to be transformed. God, please transform me. Just know God is there for you. Call on him. And if you call on him, he will answer. Ask him to save you. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to change you from the inside out. And whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're struggling, just know that when you do, God promises that all of your sins will be forgiven. That he will make you clean. He will make you brand new. 
And there are those of you who are here that are at this moment, right? That God brought you here today. God brought you here today. Today is the first step in your walk with Christ. Today is the day that you can make that, that walk in repentance towards God. And there are those of you that would say, yes, that's me, Jesus, please take control of my life. Take my life and save me. If you're joining with us online, just lift your hands up right now. If you're in the room, just lift your hands up. Because we want to connect with you. We want to help you to know that you are loved and valued. Would you all just take a moment, let's pray this prayer together out loud. Heavenly Father, save me from my sins. Forgive me. It is through your son that we are made new. Make me brand new. I can't get out of this life and I can't go on this life without you. I need your help. Cleanse me. Use my life to glorify you in all that I think, think and say that I do. Make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe growing up, you heard the term Eucharist used in your faith background, but never really understood what it meant. Well, the term was used by the early church fathers like Ignatius and others, and simply put, Eucharist means to give thanks. The Eucharist is the Christian ceremony of giving thanks to God for his salvation through his son Jesus. And during the Passover meal with his disciples, Jesus used the Greek verb eucharisteo, thanking God for his provision when taking the bread and the cup of wine. And with these symbols, Jesus was foreshadowing his upcoming sacrifice on the cross. In other words, he would exchange his life for ours so that we would not stand condemned before God because of our sins. We truly have so much to be thankful for. Moving forward, Jesus would encourage his followers to take time to remember his sacrifice and give continual thanks for it. And so today, as you celebrate this Eucharist by taking the bread, which represents his body, and the cup of juice, which represents his blood that he shed on the cross, spend some time and give thanks to God for all that he has done for you in Christ Jesus. In just a moment, we're going to give you a few minutes to do just that. And we want to encourage you to take each element and give thanks to God for his incredible gift of his son Jesus who died for each of us. Now, husbands, fathers, use this time to lead your wives and your families in prayers of thanksgiving for what Jesus did for you. Make this a time of worship, a worship of thanksgiving. Thanks for joining us for worship today. For more information about our church and our ministries, please go to sebastian.church. We really hope that today's message spoke to you and encouraged you to follow Jesus. Be sure to check out our website or our app to see our other ministries and learn more about what SEC is doing in our community. SEC continues to grow and our ministries are doing big things for Jesus. If you're looking for a way to get plugged in, email us at info at sebastian.church. And we would love for you to consider partnering with us financially as we strive to reach our community with the love of God and the gospel of his son, Jesus. If you would like to give securely online, visit our website or click the Give Now button on your screen. We hope to see you again soon.